Okay. Speaking of tough finale, a guy who once coached on the Ultimate Fighter many moons ago, actually was on the Ultimate Fighter many moons ago as well, is our next guest. The current reigning defending champion of the UFC's bantamweight division, the man who will be defending his title on Saturday night against his longtime rival, Cody Garbrandt, TJ Dillashaw, is standing by. TJ, how are you? Doing good, man. How are you? I'm doing really well, and thank you for doing this before heading out to Los Angeles. Or are you in Los Angeles already? No, I'm in Anaheim right now. I'm in my gym, the training lab. I uh, just got done with practice, actually. Okay, well, I appreciate you doing this very much, TJ. Uh, obviously, you're looking forward to a, f to a fight, to a title defense, all that and more. But part of your, your, your mindset heading into this, is there any part of you saying, on Sunday morning, I won't have to think about this guy ever again? Is that a motivation at all in, in, in the build-up to this fight? <laughs> no, I mean, it, it won't be really a motivation. It'll be, I mean, it'll be nice after the fact. But, you know, I don't, I don't think about that now. I don't try to add any any extra animosity or pressure to the fight. What I like to do is I like to get out there and enjoy this, enjoy this fight week, enjoy getting out there in front of the crowd and uh, having some fun, man. I don't need to add anything to it. Okay, so then on the flip side, the buildup like this week, face-offs, things like that, do you enjoy this or, or, or is that kind yeah. of annoying? No, I enjoy it, man. I enjoy this process. Um, you have to. Because <laughs> if you didn't enjoy it, this, this job would be too much. It'd be... I mean, there's there's so much that goes into fight week, all the media, these interviews with you. Like, you know, I don't mind doing this stuff. It kind of gets my mind off the, the everyday training. You know, this last 12 weeks of my training camp has been the same thing day in and day out, game planning, practice, pushing yourself to the limit. Now I get to wind down the training. I don't have to train as hard, make the body feel good, and then, you know, get distracted a little bit and talk some crap and face off and, uh, yeah, just, and just try to enjoy it all, you know? Correct me if I'm wrong, you have sensed a different Cody Garbrandt in the build-up to this fight than the build-up to the first fight. Is that accurate? And if so, why? Yeah, man, I've definitely felt a different a different uh, Cody Garbrandt. You know, the first one was uh, me having to defend myself left and right from accusation after accusation and just, just them being complete jerks the entire camp. This camp was uh, real quiet, you know what I mean? Like, even, like, when we were in New York doing uh, the presser, he started off very uh, polite. Shoot, he might even, I think he was even saying, yes, sir, no, sir, thank you, sir. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, but now it's been, it's, so it's been real quiet, man. It's just a little bit different, which, you know, uh, I'm actually kind of surprised that he, he learned his lesson. I didn't think he'd be smart enough to learn, but, uh, you know, I guess you can't really talk too much crap once you get knocked out. And I, I didn't expect that. I expect him to continue to run his mouth. Okay, so do, do you feel like this is kind of a, a crack in his armor, is like that, that maybe this is a sign that he's not as confident going into this camp? How do you take this, or into this fight, I should say? Absolutely, I do. He's definitely not as confident. He knows I'm the better fighter. He knows I'm going to go out there and I'm going to win again, so he doesn't want to look, he doesn't want to look bad again. You know, I, I'm looking to uh, finish him off two fights in a row, and he'll never get a shot again. As long as I'm champ, he'll never get a shot again. And he's uh, ruining his career at 135 pounds. So... Our great team here uh, brought this up to me, and I, and I wanted to get your, your thoughts on it. When the UFC books these immediate rematches, right? So it, the essentially what happened with, with you and, and, uh, and Hennon Brow, where someone wins the belt and then they do this immediate rematch. It happened with Rose Namunas and Ioannia Jacek, Weidman Silva, Benson Henderson, Frankie Edgar, Frankie Edgar, BJ Penn, Tim Sylvia, Andre Arlovsky, Vitor Belfort, Randy Couture, and now you're having this fight on Saturday. The guy who won the belt... Basically, you in this situation always wins the second fight. Oh, yeah. Why do you think yeah, that is? I mean, it, the confidence going into it. Um, I, I'm the extra, the, I feel like the better fighter has gone out there and, and proved himself. Um, I mean, really, and I, I get better. I mean, I can't only speak about myself, but I get better in rematches. You know, I get better the more I get to figure someone out, the more I get to game plan for someone, the better I do. You know, I'm a, I try to be as a cerebral fighter as possible, which I feel like if you're, if you're winning the belt, that's the kind of fighter you are. Um, it's going to play in your favor, you know. Do you feel like he made a big mistake here? But he should, have, like, from a confidence standpoint, take a fight, get your confidence back, and then go after the belt. Like the UFC is is almost doing him a disservice. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, he's young, man. He's got a lot of growth still. You know, I've been around the sport now for been in the UFC, I think, for like eight years now. So you know, I've I've been I've been in this. I've done this. I know everything. Like, he's still he's still got a lot to learn, a lot to grow. Um, and he's getting back in there right away. And I'm gonna I'm gonna ruin him. You know, this is uh, a bad call on him, and uh, I'm going to go out there and prove it. You said something interesting in that um, that interview on Saturday um, during the broadcast. You said that you think that Dana White, the UFC, they all want you to win. They all want you to 
to almost get rid of him. Why do you feel that way? Man, why else? I mean, it's just uh, there's a lot of drama leading up to this fight. You know, he did a lot of smack talking. He, 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 he couldn't back it up. You know, so I was just saying that everyone wants to see me knock him out again. You know, it was a uh, it, was, it was a great one. So it's the reason why we're running their back again because nothing's going to change. Why else would they put his career on the line like that right away? You know. What's interesting about it is I felt for a long time that the UFC was really behind Cody. You know, they gave him that body armor deal. It seemed like they were really pushing him. Have you sensed a, a change in their in their thoughts? Like, have you sat down with Dana? Has anyone told you, you know, we're, we're not really feeling this guy anymore? No, man. No, it's just, it's just uh, the way I feel. Okay. That's just the sense that you're getting. Yeah. I, I, I also appreciate the fact that even on television, you know, he's wearing his shirt. You're you, you have fully embraced the the snake gimmick. You were wearing that on Saturday. That's like a part of your logo. <laughs> Hell yeah! Why have you embraced this? Well, why not, man? It's been it's been funny. It's been fun to run with it. You know, it wasn't even their insult, and they tried to turn it on me and make it a bad thing. And uh, I thought it was sweet. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's an awesome logo. Um, so I just decided to run with it. You know, turn it on him. Yes, so it's it's always easier when you when you embrace it. People can't really use it against you. Have you noticed since embracing it that you get less of that stuff on social media? Absolutely, I usually get it as I get it as a positive thing now. You know, it's like wow. Team Dillashaw, Team Killashaw, Team Snake. You know what I mean? That's amazing. That is yeah, a oh yeah. that is a lesson in how to tame the trolls right there. Yeah, how how to tame bullies too. You know, if someone someone comes at you if you're a young kid or whoever you may be, someone wants to make fun of you. Just take their ammo away, you know? I mean, it, 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 it backfires on them. Is that your official T-shirt? Oh, uh, that one is not. No, that one's a, uh, that was a, a high-end brand company that my, my wife bought me. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> oh. But no, yeah, my, my logo is, uh, I mean, I have a bunch of different shirts and a shirt and whatnot, but they're all kind of based around snakes. That is amazing. Uh, so, like, your the yeah. shirt that you'll be wearing on Saturday, like your Reebok shirt, does it have a snake on it as well? Yeah, like my last fight, even too. It'll be the same shirt as my last fight. It's a snake print. It's just the whole my whole chest is snake print. Okay. You know, it's got the rattle. It's got the rattlesnake skin color. <laughs> it's brilliant. Well done. Well done Hell on yeah, that. Oh yeah, man. Um, the snakes are scary. Snakes, they're, they're fast. They're deadly. You know, I, I plan to be the same. Uh, so obviously, we can't ignore the fact that you're fighting on the same card as DJ, and that's the fight that I think everyone wanted to see you in. Do you feel like they put you on the same card so that the stars can really align here? Or do you feel like it's just a coincidence? I no, I do. I think it, uh, the stars are aligning perfectly. Um, you know, unfortunately, it didn't work out earlier, but uh, it'll all come around and, and work out perfectly to continue to build this thing up, you know? Um, he got shoulder surgery. We didn't think we were going to be able to fight in time, but uh, we ended up fighting on the same night anyway, so I don't think it's an accident. So do you have the, has the UFC actually told you you win this fight, he wins this fight, you guys are going to fight next, no doubt about it? No. They no, have, no, no, no. Nothing like that? No. no. You you did get a, a recently a new contract, right? Yes. Are you happy? Yeah, man, I'm, I'm I'm happy. You feel like they're taking care of you? Absolutely. Okay, and this is your first fight as a father, right? Yeah, man. Yeah, it's been uh, my first fight camp as a father. It's been it's been amazing. It's crazy. My my son's already seven months old. Wow. Um, things have gone by so fast. He's got a little personality now. He's crawling. Um, it's a, it's a ton of fun. Does it feel different though, like when you're going to work, when you're preparing, when you're thinking about the fight as a dad? I'm always curious about this. Do you feel like you're you're viewing the fight or thinking about the fight, preparing for the fight in a different way with a different mindset? Um, I guess uh, it, it helps with uh, it helps with dealing with all the um, tedious stuff. You know, you get to come home and your, your son smiles at you when you walk in the front door. You know, uh, you can't hold on to any anger from practice or from from anything leading up to the fight, it uh, makes life more enjoyable, at least for me. You know, I, I've been wanting to be a father now for a while, um, and so it's just a dream come true. So it's just, made, it's just made life better all around. And for fighting, for my career, for outside of it, family life, everything. It just gives you, like, better balance, right, and perspective is what exactly. I Exactly. Yeah, I mean, you said it perfectly. I mean, yeah, better balance. You know, it just, uh, it, it just gets your mind off of things. It's really nice. Will your son be going to the fight? Not not the actual event. I would imagine that's a little too much. But is he coming with you to Los Angeles? Yes, he'll be he'll be in uh, at the hotel and all that. I, my mother in law is watching uh, Bronson 
um, the night of the fight, you know, but yes, he'll be there for the whole lead up of it. Okay. That is great. Um, and just curious yeah. about, about that first round against Cody, what did you learn from that? That uh, a mistake or, or two, or maybe even none, but that you'll hopefully try to not recreate in this fight. Cause it did look like it got dicey there for a second. Is there anything that you're looking to not recreate in this fight based on your experience with him in that first round? Absolutely, man. You learn from every fight, you learn from your wins, you learn from your losses, uh, learn what you could do better and learn what your, your opponent has. So I've absolutely learned from it. And, uh, you won't expect that ever again. In particular, could you tell us what you learned? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 you did learn something. Oh, absolutely. Anything that you did different in this in this training? I mean, obviously, Dwayne is in your corner. You have the new gym. Anything else that's different training partner wise? Um, I did even more boxing for this fight. Um, did a lot of boxing sparring on in India with um, Cubs, uh, old boxing coach out there, uh, Joel Diaz's gym. Um, a lot of world-class boxers, man. It, it has been amazing to work with those guys and learn from them, um, as well as continue to work with Dwayne, Daryl Christian, Mark Munoz, Felipe de Monica, my new gym here at the Train Lab in Anaheim. So, uh, yeah, I mean, continuing to, to grow with what I've been doing and adding some wrinkles here and there and uh, obviously, you know, putting some new things into the game plan and uh, having some fun with it. One thing I always want to ask you, what's your connection to Lomachenko? How did you, how did you actually meet him and, and develop this relationship with him? Um, I have a social media marketing buddy um, that is also was helping out Lomachenko as well, um, and I was just a big boxing fan, and so was my my buddy, um, and so he introduced us because he knew that uh, he was training in Oxnard, um, and we're close to the same weight class, and so he just kind of lined up, we had to go up and work out with him and spar with him and be around his team, and his team has welcomed me with open arms, which has been amazing. You know, I've been to some boxing gyms where it's not that way. And the two gyms that I've got to work with recently, the whole Aldea's gym and Lomachenko's camp of Ben Oxnard, have welcomed me with open arms, um, you know, let me be a part of their training, watch his last training camp, uh, be around it, learn some technique. Uh, so just uh, mutual friends, you know, mutual, like, uh, business friends. Um, just kind of hit it off from there. Uh, did you train with him at all for this fight? Yes, I did. Oh, wow. Yeah, for, for, well, his last training camp, I didn't get actually, like, physically spar with him for this last uh, fight. But I went up there and I sparred with uh, Fozzy, uh, gold medalist up there, another Russian that's a killer at their gym. And I got to sit in a couple of their practices and do some strength conditioning up there as well. So I got to be a, a part of his last his last fight. I didn't actually physically spar with him, but at least got to be part of some of the practices, you know? What, what is it like actually sparring with him? Have you ever done that? Yes, I have. I sparred with him uh, right after the Ultimate Fighter. When I got the Ultimate, coaching the Ultimate Fighter, I came down and I got to spar with him uh, Wish I would have been in shape, but hey, obviously you're not going to pass up the opportunity. But dude, he he is uh, his reaction times are insane. He's just uh, one of those guys that almost knows what I'm throwing before I even throw it. Wow. You know, um, my my movement and stuff, and I my distance is a little awkward for for a boxer, but uh, for him to be able to pick up and just his pace and his cardio and just professionalism is is awesome. I've just become even more of a fan than I already was just to see his work ethic. You know, I mean the things he does outside the gym. You know, being Sure, the guy could be a gymnast. I mean, he's an he's an athlete. Watching him juggle balls and do these reaction time drills, and all this gymnastic stuff he does. He's uh, he's he's amazing. Is, is it somewhat humbling sparring with someone like that? Absolutely, man. You know, uh, that's that's what you got to do. You got to got to put yourself in uh, situations where you don't feel comfortable. You know, you can't be the baddest man in the gym all the time because you're not going to grow. So you got to put yourself in the uncomfortable situation. That's why I was going out to Royal Diaz's gym, working out with world class boxers, working out with Lomachenko, um, you know, working out with rolling with Felipe and my jiu-jitsu, and putting myself in situations where I'm not supposed to win, you know, hmm. so that I can continue to grow. Last time you fought Cody, uh, I, I think it was the night before the fight. They they released this footage of you guys sparring. Are you expecting any surprises from the guys? Are you expecting any? bombs that they're dropping what are you expecting in this fight week from them or is it maybe just a completely tame version and and you're gonna just you know waltz right into the fight on saturday i expect a completely different camp i expect a completely different cody um he doesn't have the confidence behind him he's already they've already put out everything they possibly could they had a they had one chance to try to get under my skin and and to piss me off and that was what they were trying to do they had this uh that footage they released, I don't know if it was a sparring or if it was finding Bigfoot footage. It was uh, so ridiculous. You know, you couldn't even tell what was going on. Um, the great thing about it is that I don't have to. Mine's on national TV. My knockout's on national TV. I don't have to go and find some horrible gym footage. So I'm expecting a completely different fight week. Um, I'm in his head. I'm the better fighter. Um, 
Yeah, man, it's, it's going to be way different. Can't wait. Thank you, TJ. I appreciate okay. you doing this. We'll see you out in Los Angeles. Best of luck to you. Absolutely. Appreciate it, man. All right. We'll talk to you soon. There he is, TJ Dillashaw. Uh, that, that last answer right there got me really excited. I'm excited. And again, I will reiterate this point. This is from our great team here. I'm not sure who actually did the research, so I'll, I'll give credit to Jake, Elisa, and Nick, and Brittany as well, because I'm not sure exactly who did it. But Rose number Yunus versus Ioana, UFC 217, 223. Rose beat Ioana, 217. Rematch, he wins, 223. Chris Weidman, Anderson Silva. Chris beats the champion, Anderson Silva, 168. Wins the rematch. No. Little typo there. 162 wins the rematch at 168. 175 was Leonardo Machida. Benson Henderson versus Frankie Edgar. Benson wins at 144, wins the rematch at 150. Frankie Edgar versus BJ Penn. Frankie wins the belt at 112, wins the rematch at 118. These are all immediate rematches for both guys. Their next fight. Remember, TJ Dillashaw, Hannah Burrell, 177, never actually came to fruition. Joe Soto stepped in. Tim Sylvia, Andre Arlovsky, 59-61. And then Vitor Belfort, Randy Couture, 46-49. So typically, or historically, when you have this situation where there's a fight, title fight, challenger wins the belt, and then they do the immediate rematch, for some reason, the challenger loses. And I do think that there is something to be said for that. Now, streaks, trends, they're all made to be broken. Things can change. But this is interesting heading into this fight on Saturday. This is very interesting in my opinion. So that's the main event. Dillashaw, Cody Garbrandt, 227. DJ Cejudo, co-main event. If TJ wins, if DJ wins, it's going to be very hard to ignore those questions. TJ versus DJ. Now, if Cody wins, DJ wins, that could happen too. Everything could change. It could be Cejudo and Cody wins, and we don't talk about any of this. We'll be there on Thursday, pre-fight show on ESPN+. Plus on Friday, and then post-fight show live on ESPN Plus after the main event on Saturday from Staples Center. I am looking forward to it. Now, in around 25, 30 minutes, New York Rick will be sitting right over here. We'll talk more about 227. We'll talk about the odds, gambling, the card. And I must say, I was sitting there on Saturday night watching the Fox show, and they ran through the card, and holy smokes, this is a top-heavy card. Top two fights, phenomenal. The best of the best, as far as mixed martial arts is concerned. Rest of the card, not so much the best of the best. It's no 226, I'll tell you that. But we'll talk about that in a second. For now, I want to say hello to our next and last guest of the day. His name is Jared Gordon. And back in February, we spoke to him in studio, you will call, about his unbelievable life story, what he has overcome what he has had to endure, the ups, the downs. I mean, it's it's mind-blowing stuff. And I said at the time, and I said at the top of the show, no matter what I've done, like interviews, my regular life, I don't know if I've met someone who has overcome as much as he has. And, and to get to the point that he is um, at now in the UFC at the time, he was 2-0 in the UFC, thriving. He was getting ready to fight Carlos Diego Ferreira. Uh, it, it's just an unbelievable story and highly suggest going back if you want to learn more about him. I, I suspect a lot of people who are watching the show would, would know the life story by now, but if you haven't, it's just, I cannot do it justice. Drug overdoses, uh, homeless, I mean, just incredible stuff. But there is a new wrinkle to that story, my friends. And Jared is kind enough to be coming on the show today to talk about that and talk about what he has had to overcome as of late. So first off, let us say hello to Jared Gordon, who is joining us via the phone. Jared, how are you? Hey, Ariel. I'm very well. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Um, and, and, and before I get into what we're going to talk about, you're actually living in Milwaukee these days. So that's that's a new wrinkle. You're, you're, you're full-time living in Milwaukee because you're training at Rufus Sport, correct? This is correct. Uh, I made the, uh, the jump about three months ago when uh, Paul Felder, who's a good friend of mine, asked me to come help him for the uh, Alec Quinta fight. That never happened, and uh, I just fell in love with it, and I needed to change of pace. And uh, coming off of off of my last lo- my my fight, my loss, um, even though a lot of things uh, there's a lot of variables 
that we're going to talk about right now that, you know, the fight turned out the way it did, whatever. So I made the jump because I felt I needed to change the pace, and uh, here I am in Milwaukee. Okay. So, uh, as I said, we last saw you in action in February. You fought in Austin, Texas, and you lost that fight, as you alluded to, um, in, in a little less than two minutes to Carlos Diego Ferreira via TKO. However, less than two months before the fight, you endured a lot. And in fact, by the way, I don't, I don't know if you remember this, but when we last spoke face-to-face, -face, I went back and I noticed that your hand, and in particular your middle finger, was, was completely bandaged. And, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of figured that it was. And did you, did, wait, now that I think about it, did I ask you what happened there and you told me something else? Yeah, yeah, you had asked. I knew you were going to ask me because why wouldn't you ask me? Yeah. Um, yeah, you were like, oh, what happened to your hand? And I was like, oh, just I have a, I don't even remember what I said. I think I, that I had like a old injury or some sort of cut or blister. And you just were like, oh, okay, you just shrugged it off. And uh, I was like, oh, kind of got away with that one. Yes. Well, now it's time to talk about the truth. The floor is yours, my friend. What happened in December that led to that injury? So I, I was only a couple blocks away from my house, and I uh, went to uh, my buddy Alex's barber shop um, in the story of Queens on 21st Avenue and 31st Street. And I was waiting in the barber, and my uh, buddy Jeffrey, uh, that I trained, I've been training jiu-jitsu with him for about 10, close to 11 years now, walked in the barber shop, but there, there was an hour wait as per usual in New York City when you're at the barbershop. And um, so I decide, we decided let's go grab a bite and we'll wait in line as we're eating and we'll come back and we'll get some haircuts. So we went across the street, ate some food. As we were walking back across the street towards the barbershop, Jeff notices uh, this young man and says, oh, I, I used to teach this kid jiu-jitsu. And they started talking. So we're, we're walking as a group back towards the front of the barber shop. And I've never met this kid in my life. I'm just drinking a cup of coffee, minding my business. And out of nowhere, I didn't even notice them until they were right on us. These two guys in hoods walked up to us. Uh, one of them proceeds to spit in the kid's face. And then they swing at him. And just as uh, re a reaction, my friend Jeff jumps in the middle, at, you know, to kind of stop what was happening. And the kid pushed my friend's arm, kind of pushed him away. And at that point, that's when I just dropped my coffee and we proceeded to all fight. Um, unfortunately, this is not a cage where the environment is somewhat controlled. We were in the street. And we got bumped into by Jeff and the person that he was fighting. And we smashed into the window, the storefront window of the barbershop. And it came down on me, which I'm really lucky because it only caught my hands. Uh, if it had landed on my neck or on my head or face, it could have been much worse. Uh, but I cut my pointer, middle, and ring finger really badly. And I got 21 stitches, and it cut the ligament of my middle finger. So now I have a uh, what they call a boutonniere deformity, where the ligament is damaged, and it will never be the same. I probably have like 50% function of my finger, even even right now. Um, so, you know, me and Jeff obviously are trained. We beat the kids up pretty 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 good. Uh, unfortunately. You didn't get, it's not all on, on the video that we're going to show, but I end up taking the kid down and I, I lay into him a couple of times. And, th and that's when I realized, holy, excuse my language, I, I really cut my hand badly. Um, the people in the barbershop came out. Uh, there was a, a young lady in there who happened to be a corrections officer. And as this is all going on, these, these guys are screaming, um, I guess, like, gang, their gang affiliation, they were saying GS9, they kept saying it over and over, and, and the corrections officer actually, she works at Rikers Island, actually confirmed, yeah, these, these guys, I guess, are affiliated with the Crips because 
the stuff that they were saying she must hear all the time in prison. And um, luckily, me and Jeff are, you know, trained athletes, and we were able to control the situation. But, of course, I probably sustained the worst damage as far as, you know, like, yeah, I beat the guy up and I punched him in the face a bunch of times, but now my hand is, my ligament is damaged, and two days later I decided to sign a fight for, for a contract against Diego Ferreira. And then I had an unfortunate series of events that led up to the fight. So I got, I got 21 stitches in my hands. Everything seemed all right. About 10 days later I had the stitches removed. I start training again. I signed, I signed the contract, like I said, about three or four days later after this happened. So, you know, I got to train now. Whatever, stitches. I've dealt with stitches before, no big deal. I go back to training. I'm wrestling one day. And I go shoot a single leg, and the kid sprawls, and I hold on to his leg, and all I feel is a big pop. And I look at my middle finger, and it's wide open again. Oh. Now, I, yeah, I go back to the surgeon, a plastic surgeon this time. He stitches me up. All right, now i got to deal with this again. So, of course, with my luck, typical Jared Gordon, a week later I'm uh, walking in Grand Central Station and it's pouring out, and the whole subway station is soaking wet, and I slip oh. down an escalator. And when I say slip, like, I really, like, busted my ass. And I slam my hand on the floor, starts bleeding again, I clean it off. Looks all right. I go to sleep that night. I wake up the next morning, and my middle finger is the size of a, an Italian sausage. <laughs> oh. And so I got to go back to the surgeon, oh. opens it up, drains it, and packs it with gauze. And so my whole fight camp, all I did was run in shadow boxing, hit the bag with my right hand, and kick and kick the bag. I, I couldn't do much, but. You know, um, I was really afraid to pull out of the fight because I had missed weight before. I'm on a two-fight winning streak. I truly believe I beat Diego nine out of ten times anyways. So I said, you know what, I'm going to just deal with it. I'm not going to pull out because I don't want to look unreliable to UFC. And I'm going to fight this guy, and I'll win, and that's it. I go into the fight. I get kicked in my nuts twice in the first minute, which definitely threw my rhythm off. And the fight unfolded the way it did. It was a weird fight. Whatever. Pass off to Diego. If I can win a fight any way I can, I will also. So I'm not knocking Diego. He did what he had to do. Um, but that was, that's what happened. And, uh, you know, Ariel, like, I'm not, I'm not the person, especially at this stage of my life, to condone violence or say that you should fight on the street because you shouldn't. And, you know, I'm trying to, spread positivity and encouragement to people and, and be a, an example for, you know, for other people. But if you're going to come and do something to my friends or family, well, then I'm probably going to punch you in the face and or use other forms of, of physical harm. So, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm still human and I got upset and I probably could have defused the situation but I went ahead and did what I did, and I, I paid the ultimate price and almost lost my fingers. <laughs> so that's how it went down. Okay, so uh, that, obviously that is a lot to unpack, and I didn't know most of that. But you did provide us uh, with security cam footage that I want to play here to just paint an even clearer picture of what transpired. And by the way, do you remember the date of that incident? Yeah, it happened December 22nd. Okay. Ruin, ruined my, my Hanukkah and Christmas. <laughs> By the way, uh, if memory serves me correct, weren't you found uh, unconscious in a in a motel room from a drug overdose on Christmas or Christmas Eve? Christmas Day. Christmas Day. I yeah, I was found. Uh, yeah, I was shooting a bunch of cocaine, and heroin, and and I just woke up in the ambulance. Someone had called the uh, someone called the police, and they ripped me out of that hotel room. Yeah, so my my holiday season. It's always a little hairy, whether it's whether I'm sober or not, you know. So, um, but yeah. Okay, so so, so let us uh, let us see this footage. We're gonna we're gonna play some of it here that you provided. And before we play it, okay, it's starting right here. 
we can't pause okay just pause for a quick second i just want to uh, ask how did you get this footage so my friend alex owns the barbershop okay he provided the footage for me and okay. um that's actually uh the, it's called the barbershop you wanted me to give him a little shout out yeah so and where is it in queens yeah story of queens on 21st avenue between uh 31st street and 30 on 29th between 31st and 29th it skips the block for some reason i don't know why and and you are coming out of the shop or you were about to go in so i was there originally we left and went across the street to a little diner on the corner okay the corner. we ate and as we we're walking back that's when we saw the kid in the plaid shirt yeah okay so we're looking at it right now we're seeing you obviously i recognize you you got the beard you're holding a, a cup of coffee or something in your hand uh, some kind of cup there's the kid in the bla and the, the the plaid shirt, and then there's another guy that you're talking to. The other guy is your friend, right? Yeah, Jeffrey Gallardo. He's a uh, brown belt at Henzo's. And you know the kid in the plaid shirt? No, I've never met him. Jeff used to teach him jujitsu right there in Astoria. Okay. He recognized him, and they started talking, and I was just standing there minding my business. Okay. And then there's these two individuals. Don't play just yet. They're walking. These people you've never met before. Never seen them in my life. Okay, so it's where we paused it right here. Guy in the blue shirt looks at one of them, and now you could play it. Yeah, Boom! Just Swing. yep. Swings at him. him, and now you go after him. Yep. Knees, clinch. Knees, punches. Now, now, can we pause for a second? Can we quickly pause? There, you see the 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 glass shatters, and that was you throwing him into the glass, right? Well. Jeff and the other kid kind of bumped into us, and my shoulder, I remember, my shoulder bumped the glass, and I guess it felt like I hit like a sweet spot on a baseball bat, but the glass just shattered immediately. Now, what's, it, what's interesting about this is, I mean, it's a complete chaotic situation. It's madness. The kid in the blue shirt never engages and continues to walk back, yet he... Yep. Was, right? He was the one who, who was the catalyst in all of this. Yes, and then if you play the video a little more, he the kid that my friend Jeff is fighting drops his cell phone, and the kid in the plaid then proceeds to pick it up and run away with it like the piece of he is. Wow. So there we see him uh, going, bending down, pause that. You see that right there? He went down. The camera panned, but he actually went down and picked it up, and then he's no longer there, right? He disappears. And, leave, and, and leaves me and Jeff to fight his battle. And uh, these are the kind of people in Queens. <laughs> this, is, this is typical New York for you right here. Unbelievable. Now, do you know whatever happened to that guy? I wish I knew, Ariel. He never, I never saw him again. And, and, of course, I had to be there to fight his battle. And You have no idea. Answer. You never asked your friend. I want to, if we could, I just want to play it one more time to digest it because there's a lot to, to unpack there. You have no idea where that kid is. Your friend doesn't know where that kid is. Nothing. Nothing. No, we never. Here it is playing again. Now, they actually he actually spat at him. Spits in his face, and then as he makes his way around him, he throws that slap or punch or whatever it was. And and it's the guy in the hood that, that, that spits, correct? Yes, exactly. Did did the, the blue <laughs> shirt guy, did he say anything to prompt the spit? No. Like, those guys just came really fast, and we were all talking, and then... We didn't notice him until they were right up on us. So the kid spit in his face, made his way around him, and then he looked at him and he just threw that, that strike. So mm. then that's when it all went down. Unfortunately, as the video continues, they don't see me take, take my, uh, my foe down and pound his face. And oh. so he was crying a little bitch after that. He, uh, he was all tough, and then I was on top of him, giving him what he deserved, and uh, now all of a sudden he was... It wasn't so tough anymore. And and, and, and just dang affiliations, it was pretty funny. And and just so I have it clear, the phone that the kid in the blue shirt picked up, was that your friend's phone or the other guy's phone? The other guy's phone. Okay. Yeah, it was great. So the kid <laughs> Yeah, it was awesome. He, we were fighting his battle and he gets away with the phone and, and I walk away with uh twenty one stitches. And do you know what ever happened to those two other guys? So Obviously, there was a huge commotion. People saw what had happened, and the police came. So, you know, the NYPD comes, and they ask us what happened. We go in the barbershop. We actually watch the footage right there with the cops. Okay. So 
they they were like, look, if you press charges and we go look for these kids, what's more than likely going to happen is that they're going to say that you started with them first. And then even though we have the footage, we're going to have to arrest you also and then let the judge figure it all out. Even though you might not be guilty, but you're still going to have to go sit in jail for a night. Man, I've been to jail a little too many times, and the last thing I wanted to do, especially with that wound on my hand, was have to go sit in the 114th precinct. Then they would take me to bookings. Who knows? They might have brought me to Rikers. It's the last thing I wanted to do. So they, they were like, the cops were really cool. They were like, look, we could just make an accident report and say that you tripped and fell through the window, and we'll just leave it at that. So that's what we did. And uh, I just didn't want to have to deal with lawyers and judges and cops. And, you know, it was just wrong place, wrong time. But, of course, then I, I took a fight, and it led to my ultimate demise, I believe, that night in Austin. Now we have some photos that you provided us uh, to us of your hand. This is your hand all stitched up. Incredible okay. stuff. Um, I mean, you see him right there, 21. This is them working on your hand. Right. We're, 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 we're sort of showing a, a succession. I mean, that is, oh, geez. And yeah, I, so oh. it had opened back up. They restitched it. And a week later, it got infected again. They had to drain it, clean it out. All this pus came out. Then they packed it with gauze. And I had a gaping hole in my hand for the whole fight camp. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't spar. I couldn't grapple. It was pretty miserable. And then I I had to go to a hand surgeon because he, he wanted me to do hand surgery because now I have something called a boutonniere deformity where my finger is like a mangled mess. And I still have, I still have, uh, I'm looking at it right now. It looks like, it looks like someone hit it with a hammer and I just left it like that. God. So, and, and when you punch with it, and this is your right hand? This is my left hand. Okay. But when you punch with it, how does it feel? So the first couple of months, it definitely hurt a lot. Um, now I'm kind of just used to it, but the tip of my finger doesn't bend. So if you take your middle finger and you bend it, you know, the tip bends, the, the middle knuckle bends. So my, my left middle finger, only the middle knuckle bends. I can't get the tip of it to completely bend. So I just have, I have about 50%. 60% function of my middle finger right now. Man. Yeah, I could have surgery, but then that means sitting out longer. I want to fight. Um, I need to make a living, obviously. That's another re reason why I didn't want to pull out. You know, I want to get paid. I want to win and climb the ladder. And I don't think that I'm just like a regular, you know, B-class fighter. I truly believe that I have the ability to, to hurt people and, and win fights and, uh, you know, like, this is a game of inches, MMA. Uh, the fight with Diego went the way it did. It was it was very weird how it got stopped. My I got my arm trapped behind my back, and and then uh, Big Dan stopped it. I literally sat up, and, and I put my hands up like, are you serious? Like, this is how the fight, this is how the fight ended. And I came out of the cage that night, and I said, what the? And I looked back on, you know, I forget that I almost lost my fingers, and but, um, you know, everything happens for a reason, especially with me. And I believe that loss made me make the jump to Milwaukee. So now I'm with a huge camp in Rufus Sport. We've got a bunch of monsters here, and uh, I'm just working towards getting my next fight. And that's all I care about. In hindsight, do you regret taking that fight? Well, I mean, I didn't know what we, I didn't realize that uh, it was going to reopen. I didn't know it was going to get affected and be be delayed like that so at the time i was like you know what i have time i can still heal and i'll have a good amount of time to to spar and train and but then it it all happened the way it happened and you know i don't want to pull out of fights i want to fight if i'm injured i'm injured you know uh i i, I really believe that i'm better than diego and but it, you know this is mma and anything can happen there's so many variables and uh, he clipped me on the chin, and it went down the way it did. But uh, I don't, you know, it's not like he beat my ass for three rounds. It was only a two-minute fight, and I got kicked, squaring my nuts twice in the first minute. So that threw me off big time. It happened the way it happened, and I'm just trying to move on. You know, considering every single thing that happened just in that 
you know, less than two month stretch fights over, you're in the back. You're obviously disappointed. Like, are, are you, are you thinking, can I catch a break here? Like, how did you handle that? I mean, obviously if you would have won, it probably would have felt a little better, but it didn't go your way. And it was, it was, I'm sure quite devastating. How did you handle it mentally? Um, the first thing I said, actually, when I got backstage to, to my coach was, uh, Yes, I'm, I'm going to go to the Marines. But this is me just having uh, delusional thinking and uh, being irrational, you know, typical, typical Jared Gordon. Um, and then, you know, I kind of did go into a depression where I was like, eh, maybe I'll go back to living the way I used to live. But ultimately, I know where that would lead me, and that was never really an option. Those are just me being a little baby. And, you know, um, so I just... I just stayed on the path that I've been on and, you know, do what I do to, to keep my mind uh, sane. And, um, you know, I'm working, I'm still working towards my goal of being a UFC champion and having a long, successful career. And, and I know I will. That's all I care about. When did you drop that idea and, and essentially say, no, I'm going to, you know, resume my career and, 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 go to another level and go to roof sport like how did you go from saying in the locker room that to not going through with it so i mean there's like levels of you know even if you win you kind of like go through like a post-fight depression where like you have all that that anticipation all the anxiety then you fight you win or you lose most of the time i tend to win so i'm not used to that losing feeling but you still go through like a depression where it's all over, and you're like, even like a week later, you're like, hey, don't you remember I fought and won last week? It was an awesome fight, and and then like everyone kind of just, you know, you go back to just being you, and everyone forgets, even the biggest fights, you know, yeah. everyone's excited for a week, and then everyone moves on. Yeah, kind of, and you got to get back on the horse and get back to training, and so it was kind of the same process. I had to, I had to grieve and think about it, and and go over, you know, the things that went down in my head the injury and getting kicked in the nuts and losing. and But ultimately, also, I've been in so many worse positions that it would just be ridiculous for me to throw it all the way over. Those are like first-world problems. Ooh, big deal, Jared. You lost in UFC. It's not like I, uh, you know, lost my job at the supermarket and I'm living in a homeless shelter. You know what I mean? That would be a little more depressing. I lost in the highest level of fighting – and I still got paid for it. Big deal. Get back on the horse and, and get better at what you do. So, um, you know, I've been, like I said, I've had way more op- I have, I have I've had bigger obstacles in front of me that I've got over. So this is just one of, one of those smaller ones. Yes, it was a bump in the road, but got to get back on the horse. So uh, at this point, do you, are you worried? that this is going to plague you for the rest of your career, that your left hand will be messed up, or are they telling you that eventually you will be 100%? Uh, well, honestly, like, I, I have, like I said, the function in my finger is is a lot less than what it was, but I don't notice it because my other fingers make up for it. So, like, if I were to, like, single out my middle finger and try to do certain things with it, yeah, yes, I'd have trouble. But, like, when I grab or punch, I don't notice it at all. It feels like feels like it did that's why i didn't have surgery if i felt like i really needed the surgery i would have had it but ultimately i decided not to have the surgery because it really isn't affecting me that much at, at this point okay do you have your next assignment yet no i'm waiting to hear um i should know shortly so i'm just uh i'm campaigning for it though so you know how it is though sometimes we we wait we around a little um, and you know, it was kind of good because I just moved to Rufus sport. So I'm not trying to rush or anything. I want to get used to what I'm learning and get settled in here and then I'll get a fight and, and I'll, I'll take it as it comes. Who are you campaigning for? Honestly, I, I really haven't even thought about who, because I did that mock weight cut and I was supposed to fight at 45. I wanted to go back to 45. It looks like now though, that I'm going to be staying at 55 due to uh, certain things that have gone down in the last couple of months with guys moving up. And then we saw Max, you know, have a little trouble 
you know, with the weight cutting and health reasons. And uh, my teammate, Paul Felder, moved up to 170. It looks like he might not be moving back down. My new coach, Duke Rufus, uh, thinks that it's not worth it for me to keep cutting weight. You know, I'm, I walk around pretty big. I'm not, I don't walk around 20 pounds over the weight class. I walk around 30, 35 pounds over, over 45. So, realistically, even if I stayed at 45, I might be able to do it a couple more times, and then as I get older, I probably have to move up anyways. So, and, you know, I want to be healthy, and I want to be happy while I'm training. When I'm to 45, I really have to, I have to really be, be miserable to get down there. So, I think at this point, um, moving to new a new camp, it looks like I'm going to be staying at 55. So, now we're looking at 55ers. Not sure who. I don't think I'm in the position to call anyone out anyways. So, eh, why not? So, you can call someone out. I, Who's stopping you? No, you're right. I mean, don't be so but, bashful. Yeah, yeah. I don't really give a who it is. Okay. I just want to fight. <laughs> so, <laughs> do happens. I haven't I haven't got that far yet though with picking people's names. But uh, we'll see what happens, and uh, I'm sure you'll see me in there soon, and I'll have my hand raised. A little MSG action would be nice. I'll tell you that. I think you deserve that. Yeah, it would be, man. Fighting my home state, my home city. Um, that is kind of far, though, November. Yeah. November, right? Okay, yeah. yeah. Fair enough. I'd like to fight before that, but we'll see. I mean, maybe I could fight, get a quick win, and then have a quick turnaround or something. Well, I appreciate you sharing all of this with us, Jared, and I'm sorry that you went through all of this, and, and I hope that you can go on a string of having some, some good fortune heading your way. Uh, it's coming my way. Yes. We're pulling for you, man. So uh, in your mind, all this, is it over? Are there any, uh, I don't know, lingering repercussions? Are you still looking for those guys, or are you trying to move on at this point? Oh, no. Well, now that I live in Milwaukee, it's probably going to be hard That's for true. me to find them That's true. But, um, no, nah, man, like, that used to be something that I might have thought about. All right, I got to go find these guys now, but I can't. <laughs> I can't live that way anymore. With my luck, I'll wind up getting shot or something. And then I'll really be screwed. No, no, we hope not. So, I don't want that. And are are you, uh, things are going well as far as sobriety not, since we last spoke? You, you, you feel like you're in a good oh, spot? Yeah. Definitely. I just had um, my friend Mike Dolan, who works for uh, Athletes Quarterly, or I think he owns Athletes Quarterly. He uh, wrote an article about me recently and uh, you know, my sobriety is one thing. I don't want to be known for being a junkie. Uh, everybody, oh, that's the guy that was a junkie. But, uh, you know, now it's about helping people and, and helping, you know, the still suffering person. I'm also, you know, I, I mentioned on your show that I am a sexual assault victim as well. So that's something I'm trying to help people with, other, other victims, uh, you know, especially men. And I'm sure there's plenty of men in our sport who have been, victimized um especially men who have been raped by other men which was my situation so people you know there's a huge stigma behind especially nowadays with everything going on with sexual assault and people when i think they hear sexual assault they picture uh authority figure like a male authority figure uh sexually assaulting touching uh their 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 workers or their employees who are like young women. But truth of the matter is, is that men get raped by men in vicious fashion. And that's, that's how it was for me. So I think that, you know, that needs to come to light too. Other men need to start coming out. And they say there's, I read studies, 85% of male addicts or alcoholics were one at one time, sexually assaulted or victimized. So there's a huge correlation between me being a drug addict and a sexual assault victim. And so I think that's something that, you know, that's something I'm trying to be vocal about. Um, I'm looking for push from anyone. You know, I want to talk to kids. I want to talk to victims. I want to talk to addicts. I want to help people. I said this on your show before. Also, there's, um, there's so many people that are empowered. All they give a shit is about themselves. All these guys that are the top fighters, they could be helping so many people. Honestly, I don't know what they're doing on their free time. Maybe, maybe they are helping people in, in their own ways. But I think with the power and your, your platform, 
you can be, you know, stop being such a selfish prick and start helping other people, you know, instead of just worrying about yourself and, and I don't know. That's just my outlook. So I think that, uh, that, that needs to be brought to light more, especially in the day and age that we live in with all this rape. And, and, and sexual assault and addiction, you know, uh, opiates right now are the, the biggest killer of 18 to 34 year olds in the whole country. So they said that opiate deaths have surpassed gun deaths. No one gives a shit, so. but I think time that we start at least trying to help other people. So, I mean, that's my goal. I want to use fighting as a platform to help other people. I want to become champion, so I have a really big platform to help other people. So that's really what I'm trying to do here. That's that's my goal in life. Wish you the best, Jared. Uh, we're we're pulling for you, my man. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for being so open again. Um, and and I'm glad to hear that it wasn't you know as serious as it possibly could have been. Um, and that Milwaukee is is maybe maybe Milwaukee is the place that's going to turn around. <laughs> Yeah. Your fortune, right? Not as uh, not as exciting as New York City, but maybe that's the right place for you. And of course, you're with a great team over there, led by Duke Rufus and all the guys, and great fighters as as well. So, um, I wish you nothing but the best, my man. And and uh, please check in with us and let us know when you get that fight that you're looking for. Ariel, you're the man. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. There he is, Jared Flash Gordon. What a story. What a life. Unbelievable what that man has uh, overcome, and then slipping on the 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 escalator and all that stuff. Holy smokes. Wow. And he keeps on going, keeps on going. If, if you ever felt sorry for yourself, if you ever felt like you need to lick your wounds, which by the way is okay. It's okay to sometimes lick your wounds, not for too long, but sometimes one afternoon you're feeling down. That's fine. We're all, we're all susceptible to those feelings. And, uh, and I think it's, it's okay to do that, but obviously not for too long. But if you're ever in a, in a spot where you feel like you can't get out of a rut, Think about Jared Gordon. Think about what that man has overcome. And by the way, I don't think he's the kind of person who's looking for sympathy. You know, it's one thing to do it, you know, you could say self-inflicted or another, you know, to deal with cancer or, you know, some kind of disease that you didn't ask for. You didn't sign up for that. I get that. But you still have to overcome. You still have to try to be better and be healthier and, and cross those bridges and overcome obstacles and all that stuff. It's, it's still something, whether you feel it's in self-inflicted or not, these are still diseases. These are still, um, afflictions. And, uh, this man to me is an inspiration, what he's been able to overcome and continue on with and thrive. It's unbelievable. It really is. So I, uh, I appreciate him sharing all that with us, sharing the footage, the photos, and I wish him the best in Milwaukee.